I sometimes recommend it to people to imagine the thing you're holding a grudge over as a brick. Now, in your mind, pick that brick up and you have to carry it with you everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you actually picked up a brick, you wouldn't do it very long, right? Right. First of all, you would feel silly. Right. Second of all, it's rough on the hands, and it's cumbersome, and it's in the way. And quickly you would say, I need to put this brick down. If we did that with our anger or our angry, uh, the sin of anger where I'm holding a grudge against someone, then it would cause us to let that go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Tulsa Time with Bishop Condola. I'm Adam Minahan. It's great to have you back, Bishop. You had a little bit of a vaca- vacation uh, earlier. Yeah, uh, I think and... we filmed one since I came back. Oh, maybe we did. Maybe um, we did. It is funny. I was just thinking that uh, I, I don't hear the, the jingle, and so I think, is something wrong? Yeah, oh, that's we... right. We don't film. That's in post. Yeah, yeah that's, that's in post. That's, yeah, um, put on afterwards. We really have been getting a lot of good feedback on on Tulsa time here recently. We have over 10 uh, five-star reviews on on Apple uh, Podcasts, so and that's I, great. I saw that you suggested that uh, Father S- Smith, what's his name? Uh, uh, Father Mike Schmitz, yeah. Mike Schmitz is copying our layout, is that it? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm just <laughs> saying, I mean, I, I think I sent it over to you guys too, didn't I? Uh, I was like, man, they just came out with a... <laughs> With their videos, and it looks awfully familiar. I'm just saying, it looks awfully familiar. Yeah. Well, there's only about two ways to do this, right? So, yeah. Yeah. That's fun, though. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I also wanted to give a shout out. So, Father uh, Brian O'Brien sent me a text message uh, just a few days ago talking about uh, he received a text message from a lady who, let's see, right here it is, uh, said that her the episode that, that he did. On Eastern Oklahoma podcast, because one yeah. of the things about Eastern Oklahoma Catholic podcast is that it's not just our show, right? That we right. have a lot of other things on there as well. And one of the things we posted was uh, uh, Father O'Brien's oh uh, Pastors of Pain podcast, right. and he walked through the mass and, with Father Kerry Lukulich and talking about it, and uh, said it really helped her as a as a Catholic to understand what the mass is and the importance of it, um, and as a faithful Catholic. So she she really appreciated. It. Her name was Pam. So and and is that title Eastern Oklahoma Podcasts or Cast? It's called Eastern o- Eastern Oklahoma Catholic Podcasts. Cast. It should okay. be plural. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I remember we had this discussion in College Station when I was there, and we were thinking, okay, we're going to want the radio station to also be able to stream online, and so then we would call it Aggie Catholic Media. I think. Right. Yeah. So, you went with media. Yeah. So. Uh, as a way to denote that. Uh, also, we should give a shout out today to uh, Stephen Ditzel, Deacon Stephen Ditzel, for about 24 more hours. <laughs> yes. Uh, approximately that. Uh, Stephen is going to be ordained tomorrow evening. And uh, this evening we have the Vespers, the preordination Vespers. So uh, he'll celebrate his first Mass on Pentecost Sunday. That's pretty exciting for him. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate uh, his. Uh, time and and efforts, you know, in seminary Mm -hmm. formation, and look forward to adding him to the ranks of the clergy in the diocese. Uh, He's being assigned to Christ the King, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have accepted this summer, I think, four, maybe five uh, new seminarians, and so that puts us at about uh, 18, I think, or so. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the hiccup, though, and I was reviewing the homily that I preached for Leo and Gabriel, Fathers Leo and Gabriel, in December two years ago. Um, And I mentioned during that homily that, okay, I want everyone to pay attention. These are our last two Mexicans. Oh, yeah. We don't have any more Spanish-speaking seminarians. And actually, that's not true. Now we have Adrian Manessis. Um, But I was just, you know, highlighting for people, look, we've 
we want to be promoting vocations, mm -hmm. and uh, especially among our Latino uh, brothers and sisters out there. Uh, our seminarians, of course, can learn Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, but not all of our parishes have a Spanish mass, so it creates a little bit of a difficulty for them because if you come out of seminary speaking Spanish as a second language, still trying to learn it, but you don't have a way to practice it, uh, it's hard to maintain it. Sure, yeah. Uh, but in general, uh, this year we don't ordain a transitional deacon. And so I refer to that as an air bubble in our brake line. There you go. And uh, <laughs> what that means is next year we won't have a priestly ordination. Right. So anytime a diocese doesn't have a priestly ordination, I think it reinforces to the diocese that we want to always be looking and inviting. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always uh, telling people in Austin when I was the vocation director there that every baptized member of the church is is uh, authorized and equipped by virtue of baptism mm -hmm. to invite to invite anyone. Mm -hmm. If you see someone at your parish who, to your mind, would make a great priest, tell them. Right, yes, <laughs> yes. Tell them. Now, the response you may get is, are you crazy? No, or right. some version of that. That's fine. For many priests, they will tell you that somebody planted a seed, and when it was planted, they said no. Mm -hmm. That was my own case. Uh, and years later, that seed planted began to grow and bear fruit. So don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Invite people, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Na National Catholic Register just put out a a, a, a blog recently saying that seventy percent of ordained uh, priests were altar boys mm -hmm. growing up, right. and so like so if you see an altar boy up there, uh, you know, at mass and he he's doing great, he's doing a great job, and it giving them words of encouragement after mass, being like, hey, bud, you did a great job, and we're really no, proud I, of you. I would say look for the one who's being mischievous. He's the one who's likely has the vocation. <laughs> <laughs> the little angel yeah. is probably not the no. one. <laughs> God calls the ones who need help. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. Well, one of the things that, you know, a priest obviously does is hear confessions. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, and we do do a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, do you get a chance to hear very many confessions as a bishop? You know, uh, a couple of our parishes this past year had uh, initiatives, let's call it, or drives, where they did 24 hours confession. Mm -hmm. They had priests sign up so that they could offer confession for 24 hours straight. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I joined in on the one that was being held at St. Thomas More, and I think I came in at the 3 a.m. hour to 5 a.m. Um, whenever I'm at the cathedral and available, I hear confessions. Mm -hmm. When I celebrate Mass at the jail, I typically hear confessions. Anyone who asks me, right. I'll hear their confession, um, but certainly not nearly to the degree that I did when I was in campus ministry, we had an hour or so of confessions every single day with two priests mm. and full lines, plus an additional hour and a half to two hours on Wednesday evenings, and then plus the Saturday confessions. Wow. So um, in places where it's offered, typically there are people who respond. That's true. Yeah. Uh, when Father Brian Brooks, who's the pastor of St. Benedict, where where I go, mm -hmm. he, he made an effort to increase the amount of uh, hours that, for, for confession. And I asked him, oh, it was a couple years ago, I think, when he started, I said, like, well, is it being received well? Or is there, is there you know, people coming? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. He says, basically, as a pastor, if you open it up and you stay consistent with it, you're going to have people that, that are going to yeah. come. And I think to tell people, uh, you know, as a pastor, you want to make frequent announcements and things like that just to, you know, you always have new people in the church. Mm -hmm. um, we did, I would say that we, the church in the United States and maybe other places where this is done, we did ourselves sort of a, or, or, or let's say it was the law of unintended consequences. Uh, when we began this practice of having big Advent and Lenten penance services. So the the practice, the custom has formed where uh, almost every parish will have a particular night in Advent or Lent. They'll invite as many priests they think they need, 
10, 20 priests sometimes. Uh, and then people come for confession and there's a big penance service and so forth. Uh, the unintended consequence that developed out of that was a mindset among the Catholic people that I need to go to confession just twice a year. Right. Or maybe even just once a year. And I guess, you know, coupled with that is perhaps a, a view of confession as something very distasteful. Mm. Uh, we don't like to admit our weakness. We don't like to appear vulnerable or weak in front of someone else. And uh, so that may cause people to shy away from the confessional. But if we would remember and, and maintain our focus, and maybe the problem is that, that uh, we as pastors need to do a better job of, of uh, reminding people this is the point. If we would remember the absolute joy that God takes from our repentance, if we would remember the smile that it puts on God's face right. when we, in just ordinary, just plain humility, simple humility, recognize, I should not have done that, and, and go and confess that to God uh, through this sacrament that he has given us, uh, it would, that would help us a lot, I think. And it would it would make confession more frequent or more regular. I would say is the the good mm -hmm. word uh, for people. I recommend to people to use their phone, uh, their devices to help them. We all have these crazy calendars on these devices, and you can set up all kinds of reminder bells and whistles and whatever. Put a recurring appointment for confession in your phone. That's a great idea. Set it for monthly or every other month or every six weeks or whatever. And then when it pops its head up, it'll remind you, because, of course, it's easy in the midst of busyness mm -hmm. to, uh, to forget. Look around. You know, you can look on our website, or I think there are even that masstimes.org mm -hmm. website. There are lots of places these days to find the penance, the, the confession schedules of parishes all over everywhere. Right. So find a place that fits us, you know, where you typically would be, mm -hmm. near a school where you pick up your child, or if you work downtown, a, a church close to downtown, or if you're early morning or late evening, all that kind of stuff. Uh, also, it is incumbent on pastors to make sure that, that uh, the sacrament is available anonymously to people. So confessionals, should be set up in some form or fashion such that a person who wants to can simply be anonymous. And all of us, the faithful, uh, we should remember that we have that option, and that also will help us right. to go to confession if we've done something that we feel particularly embarrassed about or something. No problem. Go anonymously. Mm -hmm. Um, you could wear a mustache and little glasses. glasses. <laughs> <laughs> you could disguise your voice, um, and uh, but but make use of the sacrament because it's a joy. The whole point of it is is abundant life mm -hmm. and joy. Uh, people typically are are um, you know are, are what's the word I'm looking for? People typically feel closely connected to the joy they feel when they come out of the confessional. Oh, yes, yeah. Why deny yourself that? Right, yeah, I mean, because it's, it's, it's so healing, mm -hmm. right? You know, when you reconcile yourself with the Creator, with, with our Lord, you know, you have this vice that's, that's like gnawing on you, that's grip, gripped you, and, and that's been let loose, and you're now united with our Lord and made for who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's freeing, right? Yeah. And it, it, there's a healing aspect to this. And I think there's something in us... Uh, maybe it's a form of pride, but, you know, we tend to be high-achieving people, you know, as a, as a country or whatever. And for everyone who, who struggles with a habitual sin, a sin that they just keep confessing over and over and over, uh, there can, they can reach a point where they just say, what's the use? I just confess it and I keep falling into it. Well, the use is that repentance is real. Mm -hmm. Uh, one does not have to know that this time is the last time I absolutely know that I can conquer it this time. 
one doesn't have to know that mm -hmm. to make a very good confession. One simply has to desire that, uh, you know, to be able to say in your prayer with God, I hate this. I hate this sin. I wish I could overcome it. I, I'm, I feel sad that I'm so weak in the face of it, but I want to be through with it. Mm -hmm. That's all that's required. Right. That's an excellent confession. Move forward and don't worry about the fact that, look, given my track record, I'm right. going to be here again next month. I'll, I'll see you next week, Father. <laughs> that is no problem. Right. Uh, priests themselves struggle sometimes with uh, habitual sins. Priests themselves, even before they became priests, mm -hmm. uh, visited confessionals and so forth. So. Yeah, so I thought it would be it, it would be a good idea to maybe talk about uh, five or six different uncommonly confessed sins. Uh, not not to make everybody's uh, laundry list of or confession list longer, uh, but to bring th to the mo top of mind and realize, hey, maybe I am doing this. Maybe this could be an examination of conscience of sort to where when you do confess it again, it's freeing, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're uh, you're reconciling with our Lord. Uh, and so it may be a good idea to, to take a, a, a good examination of conscience. So we came up with about six different things that maybe are less commonly confessed. Uh, you want to you wanna start I, us off? I would say that for any individual they might be, but for any confessor, uh, certainly these are things that we hear uh -huh. uh, regularly in the confessional. Sometimes they're they're less understood. You right, know? sure. And, uh, you know, that does bring up the other point that, again, with electronic means and all, it, it is funny, you know, people will come into the confessional with their phone out on the, uh, what's that app, uh, Adoramus or Ad, Ad, I forget the name. Mm -hmm. There's a number of apps now right. that have an examination of conscience on them. So they'll have their phone out because they've got that app pulled up. Mm -hmm. And they'll always say, Father, I'm not scrolling. <laughs> right, yeah. I'm not checking my Facebook. Uh, but but uh, they're using it because it has the the uh, act of contrition. That's also something that keeps people away is because they feel embarrassed because I forgot the act of contrition. It has the act of contrition on it. Uh, has an examination of conscience. So it makes it really easy to just pray quickly through that while waiting in line. And uh, then one is ready. Mm -hmm. But we were we were looking at a few mm -hmm. here, um, and then I also brought the catechism, Good. which, you know, I always love my catechism. I just right. do. I, I put the nice uh, little tabs on there, tabs in there, and uh, I recommend to people make sure that you have a catechism and that you use it because this is along with the Bible. This, for Catholics, is the way that we continue to grow in our relationship with God and with the church that he has given us, uh, is by being more and more familiar with the teachings of the church. Mm -hmm. um, but we can look at some of these things in the, the catechism. One of the sins that we were thinking about was sloth. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things about sloth... It is, it is true that if a person is simply being lazy, mm -hmm. uh, they're just being a lump, and they know that they ought to do X, Y, or Z, and there's nothing really preventing them from doing it, but they just are being a lump. Okay, that could be sloth. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, make sure that it's not simply you recreating. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes people feel guilty about taking some time off. I think probably many parents feel this way. Mm -hmm. uh, you may feel guilty about, I just need to sit down and rest for a bit. Uh, that's not slow, so that's right. needing to, to recreate and take time off. Another thing not to confuse it with is what in the tradition is called Acadia. Mm. or sometimes it's pronounced acedia. And acedia is, it acts like sloth. Uh, it is a distaste for holy things. And so, for example, the way it may cause a person to think of sloth is because I don't want to pray, I don't want to go to Mass, 
uh, I just feel apathetic about spiritual things. That really is more of an attack of the evil one. Mm. And uh, so it's more of a spiritual uh, category than a sin, something that a person is doing uh, on purpose or something, and requires a prayer, you know, a prayerful approach to that, to ask God to protect me and to release me from this, uh, this burden that I feel about spiritual things, holy things. And this prayer, that prayer is probably pretty efficacious, right? Because you don't have the feeling of wanting to do it, right? You know, there's no like love, like feelings that right. you have, but you're doing it because you you have the realization that I need my Lord. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, paragraph 1866 in our catechism has something to say about sloth itself. Let's see here. Um. It's mentioned as one of the capital sins, Mm -hmm. uh, sloth is. And uh, remember, sin is something that, uh, whether venial or mortal, it's something that uh, I I shouldn't be doing, or it could be a sin of omission, something Mm -hmm. I should be doing, and I'm, I'm failing to do it. And so... There has to be freedom. There has to be sufficient knowledge about what the sin is and so forth. So um, we also have in the catechism, my own writing here. <laughs> these, these are not my glasses. These are my real glasses are in the shop getting repaired. And so these are my old prescription. Oh, they're a little, little uh, less strength. They're probably um, ruining my eyes because I'm using my old subscription. But um, yeah. while, while you're while you're finding that, let me ask you a question. Like, do you think that uh, busy people like? So I think I, I think you hit on something very important, right? When you're talking about sloth um, and acedia, that it's not necessarily just something like just being lazy as far as like just sitting on the couch and being a couch potato or whatever, right? Can busy people uh, fall into the sin of acedia or achadia? Well, I think overwork can cause a kind of depression Mm -hmm. in a person that looks like sloth. And of course, sometimes people do suffer from depression. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a person who is struggling with depression is not going to want to do anything either. That's not sloth. That may be depression Mm -hmm. that they're struggling with. Um, but yeah, sloth, the catechism says it goes so far as to refuse the joy that comes from God and to be repelled by divine goodness. It sounds almost impossible, but it can happen. And that's where discipline can help us mm-hmm. to do it to, for, for instance, to go to mass, even though I don't feel like going mm-hmm. to go because I know I ought to go. That's a good enough reason. Um, industry is one way to, to work against sloth is to find small good things to do. You don't have to take on the world. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's something I'm prone to do is to think up some huge big plan and but then I don't feel like doing the whole huge big huge, huge big plan yeah, today. Right. Okay. Just get up and and do the laundry. You know, just do something. Right. Uh, another one we were talking about was gossip. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the Catechism, gossip is listed in the section on the Eighth Commandment, um, paragraph 2475. And gossip is one that I hear pretty often in the confessional and one that we uh, should pay attention to because we live in a society and a culture right now, and our media culture, I think, kind of fosters an insensitivity in us to gossip. Mm-hmm. Um to speaking poorly of others. Um, Justice demands that we not speak ill of other people. We may have to speak ill of someone if we're addressing some circumstance with them or something. But to just be talking to other people about someone else, uh, even if what they've done is wrong, uh, that can fall into gossip that can become a, an occasion where we're simply gossiping about someone. 
uh, in that moment, it would be good to remember the mercy that God shows to us. Mm -hmm. God does not gossip about it. <laughs> right. Do you, do you think that sometimes that this could be packaged as, oh, I just need to vent, or I just need to like go to my buddies and say, like, I'm not talking bad about them, but you wouldn't believe what they did, you know, and then like, it's almost like you try to say something like, no offense, but, and then like you say something offensive. Uh, yes. You see, do you think and, that could be? And it is true. In other words, a person may well need to, quote, vent, but find a safe person, mm -hmm. one person, uh, and find a way to do it that doesn't focus so much on them, but focuses more on how I'm reacting to something. Mm, that's a good point. Uh, you know, Joe said this the other day. I was experiencing X, Y, Z that day, and the way I took it, it, it uh, caused me to think X. And then I'm focusing on how I'm being affected by it mm -hmm. more than what a dirty, rotten scoundrel Joe is, you know. Right. Yeah, because that's not, that's not going to help us, either of us. Right. Um, one of these that's on here that's confessed a lot by by people is cursing. Uh, of course, we have the commandment, the second commandment, which which uh, warns us against taking God's name in vain. Mm -hmm. That's that's um, uh, confessed a lot, but it happens a lot. And again, the culture around us doesn't help us. I mean, think of the TV shows and the movies and the things that we see. Uh, it's become so ubiquitous mm -hmm. that it's it's literally hard to get away from. Um, the, uh, the use of the Lord's name in vain is one form of cursing. But I heard a definition years ago, and I don't remember where I heard it, but uh, the the idea was this, cursing is the sign of a weak mind trying to express itself forcefully. <laughs> I, I always liked that. The sign of a weak mind trying to express itself forcefully. It's saying, I don't have enough um, vocabulary. Mm -hmm. My vocabulary is insufficient for me to be able to express something strongly without resorting to a curse word. Well, if you think about that, that's kind of a, a, a spurring, you mm. know, an encouragement. Yeah. Spend some time with a thesaurus, you know? <laughs> um, I also think spending time uh, with good, holy people around you. Yeah. Right. I know that for me, I'm, I'm prone, I, I've been prone to, I will say something with a certain group of friends and then like, right, like go back to it and think like, I would never say that with this other group of friends. Mm -hmm. I was just around these people, and it my vocabulary changed almost while around these people. Right. Um, that I would never say this kind of thing. Sure. In, in a normal day to day, you know, basis. Right. But yeah. you have holy friends around you that you know continually show you know the, the goodness of God and, and things like that. Then it lifts you up. But if a person finds that look, cursing is just such a normal part of my life, confession can be a way to help. Break into that. that. Break that, sure, yeah. Uh, because you you will be focusing, okay, I've confessed that, I want to make amends for that, and I want to move away from that. Uh, I used to talk to, to students about creating their own curse word. Uh, so, in other words, it's just a little trick of the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Dag Nabbit is an example. You right. know, I mean, that's a Bugs Bunny example, right? Um, Dag Nabbit sounds like a curse word. Mm -hmm. um, oh, boggers, you know, or anything. <laughs> uh, if a person finds that they regularly say God, oh, God, then reverse it. Oh, dog. <laughs> Just say dog <laughs> instead. And if you do that frequently enough, pretty soon you've, you've trained your mind that when your body and when you are feeling this emotion, when mm -hmm. you're... you're soul is feeling this emotion, that it immediately causes your brain to say, oh, I say this, mm. and then you go with that. And uh, because that's all those words are, is there are ways for us to release emotional energy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you drop a hammer on your toe, invent something to say. 
what do what do they do in the comics? Right? They use the squiggles. Is that what they call that? Yeah, yeah the little symbols and the, the little symbols, hieroglyphics. <laughs> uh, it's a form of that. Mm-hmm. You know, you're creating your own nonsense words. Uh, another one that we had here on the list was, of course, anger. And while it comes up a lot in confession, often it seems to me that uh, often what people are confessing is the emotion of being angry, more so than the sin of anger. Feeling anger is not itself a sin. Many things may cause us to feel anger. Um, again, dropping a hammer on our foot. Uh, if you have a near miss in traffic, after you get over the the shaking of it, mm-hmm. what do you normally feel? Anger. anger. Yeah. So there are many things that may make us feel angry. That's not a sin. That's just an emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, often we were taught in ways when we were young that caused us to think, if I feel anger towards someone then I'm sinning. No, you just feel angry. Maybe something happened between you that caused you to feel angry. Sometimes what happened is justified. Mm -hmm. You should feel angry at what they're doing. The sin of anger is when I nurse it. It's a choice to take this anger that I feel and to build it and to live with it Mm -hmm. and to nurse it along. Uh, holding a grudge is sort of an allied sin. I, I sometimes recommend it to people to imagine the thing you're holding a grudge over as a brick. Now, in your mind, pick that brick up and you have to carry it with you everywhere. Mm-hmm. If you actually picked up a brick, you wouldn't do it very long, right? Right. First of all, you would feel silly. Right. Second of all, it's rough on the hands, and it's cumbersome, and it's in the way. And quickly you would say, I need to put this brick down. If we did that with our anger or our angry, uh, the sin of anger where I'm holding a grudge against someone, then it would cause us to let that go. Mm -hmm. Look, they did that. I'm going to forgive them for that. In this case, forgiveness doesn't mean, oh, everything's fine. Forgiveness just means I've got more important things to do than to carry this brick around. Right. So I'm going to decide on my side of the equation to put it down, to let go of of living with that and dwelling in that. There might later be a reconciliation. That requires both of us. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can't control that. Because if they don't want to reconcile with us, well... We're not going to have a reconciliation. But even if we don't reconcile, I can put the anger down from my side mm-hmm. and stop uh, ruminating on it, right? And so that's a good thing to confess if we find that we're carrying a grudge and we need to put it down. God will help us to, to put it down. Do you, do you see that uh, when you get to the point where you're carrying that grudge, when you're carrying that brick around, uh, that it it's the gateway to other sins? Sure. Yes. Uh, all sins are gateways to other sins. Sure, right. right. Yeah. Any sin that moves us away from God to the degree that it moves us away from God moves us more into the camp of the enemy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, then we had envy and lust. We, we, in a way, thought of them together, but they, they don't necessarily go together, but they are very common. Uh, envy is an interesting sin. It's a... It's a sadness at another's good. That's what envy actually is. We don't typically think of it that way. But uh, if I hear that someone else has got something good going on and I want that, then I might feel envy if I'm feeling sad that they have it. The Catechism in 2553, it says, Envy is sadness at the sight of another's goods and the immoderate desire to have them for oneself. Immoderate desire, that's the point there. It's not to say, okay, my friend got a brand new car. Wow, I wish I had a brand new car. That's not envy. That's just, wow, I wish I had a brand new car. Envy is feeling sad that they have one. Hmm. And envy is feeling now down about my day because I don't have one. 
Mm-hmm. Now I'm moving into envy, and that's something that I can choose to to not move into because it is a, a sin. Humility is one way to get out of it, to, to not think of ourselves in such a prideful way that we think, I ought to have a brand new car. Right. I deserve, I deserve. I deserve to have a brand new car. How come I don't have a brand new car? I'm a great person. I'm entitled to one. I'm entitled to a brand new <laughs> So humility is one way to move away from it. The other is admiration. If we would stop and think, uh, imagine if I was the smartest person in the world. For me, that's a terrifying thought. Uh, if the if I was the smartest person or the most gifted person in the world, knowing my limitations and my weaknesses, uh, if I was the mo- the smartest and most gifted person in the world, this would be a really really uh, poor world. <laughs> so when I see someone who is excellent in a way that I'm not, wow, that's worth admiring. That's worth thanking God that there is someone in the world who is smarter than I am, particularly in this particular area. It means I have someone I could go to. Right. Um, If I see someone even who's wealthier than I am, for example, well, I can be thinking, thank God that I'm not the wealthiest person because I'm not wealthy. Right. Uh, The world would be a poor place if, if I was the wealthiest one. So... It's a way for us, you know, admiration is a way for us to thank God for the goods of others that are around us, because in some ways we can share in those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one way to get out of it. Uh, And then, of course, lust. Lust is such a common sin. There's There's a sense in which it seems to me that lust is not really about sex. Uh, from the devil's point of view, he doesn't care about sex. Mm-hmm. He uses lust to draw us away from God. So uh, his aims are met just by getting us away from God. It's less about sex. But typically, lust does have to do with sex. Now, you know, I'm 63 in a week. Um, I can remember uh, Leave it, it to you Beaver. You said 63 in a week, right? Yeah. I think you said 63 and a week. And I was like, no, 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 you're not weak. <laughs> 63 in a week. <laughs> okay. I can remember watching Leave it to Beaver, right? Right, yeah. Uh, on the, and it wasn't a rerun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to think of the innocence of our television just in my lifetime. Right, yeah. The, the innocence of our media uh, in, in just our lifetime to now where... Try to find a movie that doesn't have sexual content in it. It's actually a challenge, you know. Yeah. It's not to say it can't be done, but it is a challenge. Um, I use uh, this Prime, you know, I have Prime, whatever that is, Prime. Amazon Prime? Yeah, Amazon Prime. There's mm-hmm. movies or whatever. I can spend an hour looking through that and not find anything that I can watch. Right, yeah. <laughs> anything that I would be willing to watch. Um, and so... Recognizing that lust is something that's very easy for us to fall into because it's a great good. The sex is a great good that God has built into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that inspires me to want to develop the virtue of chastity because, of course, that's how to move away from it, is to recognize sex is a natural good that God has created, and I don't want to corrupt it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's a natural good, I don't want to corrupt it. The other way to to fight against it is through love, authentic, properly defined love. <clears throat> our culture and certainly our, our media culture tends to think of love and sex always together. But the, the most foundational definition of love is willing the good of the other, the authentic good of the other. And unless I'm married to them, mm-hmm. that and even... Even if I'm married to them, sometimes in the marriage, the authentic good of the other is not going to involve sex. Right. And if I'm not married to them, it's never going to involve sex. And therefore, uh, chastity is the path Mm -hmm. uh, to move away from lust and to overcome it. But confessing these things is the path to joy. That's right, yes. Because these are all things that 
if we're carrying them around with us, they're going to weigh us down. Mm -hmm. They're going to impact our joy. Confessing them, letting God remove them from our life so that we can uh, start again, knowing that we can confess again, is going to be a path to joy. Yeah, I mean, every Catholic is one good confession away from sanctifying grace. That's it, yeah. I mean, every, yeah. Well, it's one confession away. Yeah. Um, if if your confirmation was a long time ago, the Holy Spirit is very close. That's right. Even yeah. if it was a long time ago, go to confession. The Holy Spirit is very close. Yeah, I mean, the, the joy, I, I loved what you said at the beginning of this episode, where the joys of heaven that are that I'm rejoicing when a sinner, you know, uh, goes to confession. Uh, and Or even just repents. Just repents. You know, Confession begins with repentance, and repentance begins, ideally, right after I've realized, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Right. Which is a grace. Right. It's just God continually calling us back to Him. And so, you know, if I have committed a sin and immediately recognize, oh, I should not have done that. Oh, God, I'm so sorry for that. That's the beginning of confession. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I may not get to the confessional for a week, but I've already begun that process. So I don't have to, to be weighed down, burdened by it mm -hmm. uh, for a week. I can recognize, no, I've already repented of this. I'm going to confess it the next time I go. Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I loved your I loved your suggestion to to put it on your calendar. You know, as a oh, family, yeah. take take your family. You know, to confession. It's it's great. You know. For your children to see you go to confession. Uh, That's for, for sure. For, yeah, for dads and for moms to see, to see them go to confession and know that, hey, dad dad needs Jesus just like you need Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mom needs Jesus just like you need Jesus. Right. Um, so uh, there, there's something powerful about, I think, going together as a family and instilling that habit as mm -hmm. a family to go. So yeah. um, any other last concluding thoughts? No, I think uh, I think that it's a sacrament that we take for granted simply because it's so available, but it's one that has so much richness for us throughout our life. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in to Tulsa Time with Bishop Condola. We'll see you guys next week.